Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. In our last episode, we learned about the state of Madagascar under the de facto rule of Prime Minister Raini Lairi Funi. While his efforts to attract foreign investment attracted large sums of capital and seemed to be enriching the Amerina economy at first, a minor smallpox outbreak in Tuamasina slowed down the importation of currency to the island, resulting in a dramatic economic recession. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister's attempts to improve Madagascar's relationships with the United States and Britain left France feeling boxed out and insecure about their future status on the island. In today's episode, the relationship between France and the Kingdom of Madagascar continues to worsen, leading to the outbreak of another French invasion of the Eighth Continent. Season 4, Episode 26, The Malgasy Take Manhattan. One of the most interesting aspects to study about early modern Madagascar was its constantly shifting and complex relationships with various foreign powers. On the one hand, you have these simpler relationships defined almost entirely by commercial relations. The United States and the Sultanate of Zanzibar each had active merchants working in or around Madagascar, but had basically no ambitions on the island outside of trade. They also lacked any sort of major influence within the Malgasy government. So these relationships were, for the most part, stable and uncontroversial. On the other hand, there's the British. So far in this season, Imerina's relationship with Britain has shifted in the polar opposite direction multiple times. From close allies under Radama, to a more guarded friendliness under Rana Feluna at first, to outright hostility in the brink of war under Rana Feluna later, and then back to the state of friendliness under the Anglophilic Rainilaya Rifuni. And then there's also France. The relationship between France and Madagascar historically ranged basically between okay to horrible. The French had been long-time commercial partners of the Merina's main rivals, the Sakalav, even before Merina reunity. During and after Radama's rule and the rise of the Kingdom of Madagascar, relations with France remained cold, since Radama's conquest of Tuamasina and the far north conflicted with French territorial and trade ambitions. The two countries had been involved in multiple shooting wars by this point, and apart from a short exception during Radama II's time on the throne, there had never been a time when the franco marina relationship was better than neutral. The main individual who had kept franco malgasy relations from becoming truly catastrophic was the famous French Andriana, Jean Laborde. While his first stint in Madagascar had been spent as an industrialist before his eventual exile, Jean Laborde acted a more overtly diplomatic role upon his return in 1861. The Frenchman acted as the French consul in Antanarifu, a title which he retained for the rest of his life. In this position, Laborde acted as a valuable and trusted line of communication between the French and Malgasy governments, an irreplaceable link in a period of growing animosity between the two powers. Raini Lairifuni's increasingly apparent desire to marginalize French economic influence in favor of British and American influence did not go unnoticed by the French. Similarly, the decision to convert Madagascar to a form of Protestant Christianity and begin marginalizing the French-aligned Catholic population further inflamed matters. However, Laborde had acted as a moderating influence on the French reaction. While French foreign officers raged against Madagascar slipping further and further from the French sphere of influence, Laborde was keenly aware that Madagascar had never really been under their influence in the first place. He, after all, had been exiled the last time he pushed his luck there. Having learned his lesson from his involvement in the failed Lambert coup, he urged that the French should approach Madagascar with friendliness and caution, or else suffer the loss of what little influence they still had on the island. But then, in 1879, Jean Laborde passed away, being buried in an impressive tomb in his old stomping ground of Montessua. And to make matters worse, in this already tenuous time with the diplomatic link between these two nations lost, France elected a new premier. Now, to briefly talk about the state of France at this point, the country was going through a bit of a crisis. France, long considered the most powerful and preeminent land army in Europe, had been humiliated in an overwhelming and crushing defeat at the hands of their neighbor Prussia just nine years prior. Now, following the Franco-Prussian War, a whole lot of stuff happened. Some governments failed here, some rebellions there, some constitutional crises there, and it ultimately amounted to the rise 
of a very bitter and revenge-happy political culture. In fact, the word revanchism itself, widely used to describe a country's desire to avenge a humiliation and retake lost land, originates from the bitter French political culture of this period. It was in this culture of defeat and desire for revenge that Jules Ferry rose to power, becoming the French Prime Minister in 1880. Ferry proposed a solution to satiate both his and his countrymen's desire to avenge their terrible defeat, a glorious victory in the world of colonial conquest. Now, we're going to take a brief pause before coming back to the history so we can get a word from this episode's sponsors. Jules Ferry is often labeled as the architect of 19th century French imperialism. Of course, France had been an empire, and even a colonial empire, long before Ferry. The country had, of course, colonized much of the modern USA, Canada, and parts of the Caribbean and even India in the 18th century. They also owned a few coastal forts and islands in Africa, including a few in Madagascar like Réunion and Nocia Bay. The country had also, notably, performed by far the largest European invasion and conquest anywhere on the African continent to that point, with its invasion of Algeria in the early 19th century. This aim of conquest and colonialism slowed down after the invasion of Algeria, but under Ferry, French colonialist expansionism was revived and doubled down on. The new French prime minister first saw his desire for conquest materialize in 1881, with the French army invading and capturing the country of Tunisia in northern Africa. Ferry also launched a war in Southeast Asia in 1883, hoping to expand French colonies in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia and soon had his eyes fixed on Madagascar as his next colonial triumph. While much of the government and public had supported Ferry's conquests at first, there was also a major portion of the public who displayed skepticism towards this overseas aggression. In an effort to convince these doubters, Ferry delivered a speech in front of the Chamber of Deputies, illuminating the mindset that justified his adventurous foreign policy. In his speech, he listed three main defenses for his policy of colonial expansionism. The first of these justifications was related to the economy. Contrary to what you might expect, Ferry made no appeals to the idea of taking local natural resources or manpower from colonized areas. Rather, he justified colonial conquest as a way of securing future customers for French goods. Ferry argued that since multiple countries were industrializing across Europe, there was no longer a large market there to buy French goods. French consumers were increasingly purchasing foreign products, making it even harder for French businesses to find an economic niche. Therefore, to compete economically, the French would need to conquer new colonies, since the population there could then be transformed into a captive market for French goods, free from foreign competition. Ferry also invoked strategic and military needs. Colonies were needed as bases for the French Navy. To quote from his speech, A warship, no matter how perfect in its design, cannot carry more than two weeks' supply of coal, and a vessel without coal is a wreck on the high seas, abandoned to its first occupier. Hence the need to have places of supply, shelters, ports for defense and provisioning. This is why we needed Tunisia. This is why we needed Saigon and Indochina. And this is why we need Madagascar, and why we will never leave them. Lastly, Ferry invoked a final key justification, the ideology of the civilizing mission. He claimed that Europeans had a moral obligation to conquer and uh, civilize the rest of the world. Now, believe it or not, this was actually a very controversial idea even at the time, which you can tell by the fact that in transcripts of this speech, Ferry often stops and restarts, probably due to being interrupted by members of the chamber. Even at the time, the atrocities of previous colonial ventures were known, so Ferry tried to distance his own form of colonization from other previous colonial conquests in history. To quote from his speech, Gentlemen, we must speak more loudly and honestly. We must say openly that indeed the higher races have a right over the lower races. I repeat, that the superior races have a right because they have a duty. They have the duty to civilize the inferior races. In the history of earlier centuries, these duties, gentlemen, have often been misunderstood 
And certainly, when the Spanish soldiers and explorers introduced slavery into Central America, they did not fulfill their duty as men of a higher race. But in our time, I maintain that European nations acquit themselves with generosity, with grandeur, and with sincerity of this superior civilizing duty. Basically, he was saying, we should do colonialism because we are the superior race, but not like previous colonialism, which was morally terrible and wrong, but like new colonialism, which is different. Now, you might have noticed that in one of those speeches, Ferry mentions Madagascar explicitly as an object of his desire. By the time he had delivered that speech, Ferry had already been actively working behind the scenes to antagonize a conflict with the Marina Kingdom for about three years. In 1881, the replacement for Jean Laborde as the new consul to France arrived in Tuamasina, a man named M. A. Baudet. Now, the antagonistic nature of the appointment became obvious pretty quickly. While Laborde had been genuinely somewhat helpful in trying to soothe out tensions between Madagascar and France, Baudet actively demanded Medina concessions on every issue of contention. Because life is convenient like that, Baudet also laid out his disputes with the Medina in three major demands. First, there was the dispute involving the capture of a ship that had landed in Malgasy port while flying the French colors. The ship's crew, which was either Omani or Swahili, were accused of illegally capturing Malgasy subjects to sell into slavery. Baudet demanded that the ship's crew be released. Next, there was the issue of the Sakalava territories. Since France had made a negotiation to annex the island of Nosia Bay in northern Madagascar, and that island contained the last rump state of the Kingdom of Boigny, Baudet claimed that the French held the rightful protectorate status over the entirety of the historical Sakalava territories. Finally, there was the question of Jean Laborde's estate. It turned out that in his time living in Madagascar, Laborde, still a French citizen, had made a pretty sizable fortune and owned a great deal of property to show for it. Well, sort of. Remember, foreigners were not technically able to own land in Madagascar. While the exact interpretation of this idea had changed from time to time, it was still widely accepted that foreign nationals residing in the Kingdom of Madagascar were essentially leasing their land from the sovereign, rather than becoming true dyed-in-the-wool owners. This tradition had been recently confirmed by the Merina Law Code. Known as Law 85, this law reified the Malgasy tradition that all land belonged originally to the one true Tompontanyi, the queen, and that her subjects, both foreign and domestic, were merely leasing her land. Therefore, according to Malgasy law, Jean Laborde's estate on his death fell to Queen Rana Falona II. Baudet objected to this inheritance, demanding that it be given instead to the heirs of Jean Laborde, a series of relatives and descendants scattered throughout France and Madagascar. Now, the actual intentions behind these demands were quite transparent. Many of the above issues had, in fact, already been resolved by this time whether that be with a recently signed treaty with the French or by other recent diplomatic precedent. The most obviously spurious claim was that of French sovereignty over the Sakhalava territories. The 1868 franco merina Treaty clearly recognized the Queen of Imerina as the Queen of all of Madagascar. The French claimed, however, that the Merina had voided the 1868 treaty by ignoring other provisions, but their behavior still indicated recognition of the Merina claim. In 1881, a French soldier was murdered by a Sakalava attacker. Crucially, in compensation, the French demanded a small indemnity for the attack from the Marina government. This was a clear recognition of sovereignty. After all, if the French were the sovereigns of northern and western Madagascar like they claimed, why would they demand that the Marina state pay an indemnity for a crime committed by a non-Marina in what is supposedly non-Marina territory? The reality was that the French government desired a cause for war against Madagascar, and Baudet was there to find one. Raini Lairifoni was very aware of this fact as well. He was aware of France's intentions by sending Baudet, and he knew that if he wanted to preserve his kingdom's sovereignty, then he would have to act fast. Preferably, he could avoid the devastation of war altogether, and arrange sufficient diplomatic support from foreign nations to pressure France and avoid war entirely. But that was the best case scenario, and he would also have to ensure that Madagascar was ready for war should a conflict break out. 
But raising military spending would prove to be a difficult task for Raini Lairifuni. The ongoing currency crisis in Madagascar, the severe shortage of viable, widely recognized currency on the island, was not only becoming a drain on Malagasy private sectors, but also a serious concern for state finances. While many domestic projects could have their costs minimized with Fanampuana labor, the shortage of actual currency in Malagasy coffers was a serious problem when it came to foreign trade. While rebuilding old gun manufacturing plants could improve the Malagasy weapon stocks in the long term, the apparent and immediate threat of French aggression meant that the Prime Minister needed weapons sooner rather than later. So he turned to an unexpected source of revenue, the London Missionary Society. If there was one group of people just as hellbent in preventing French conquest of Madagascar as Rani Lairifuni, it was the London missionaries. After all, in recent years they had finally, after decades of struggle, failure, and persecution on the island, found success in converting Madagascar. They had achieved the unthinkable goal of converting the entire island to an officially Christian kingdom. They had finally firmly entrenched themselves into the Marina system as allies and supporters of the Malgasi monarchy. Now, not only were the French threatening that same governmental system that they had spent so long trying to dig themselves into, but they were also a majority Catholic country, and under Jules Ferry, aggressively secular as well. Ferry was a promoter of laicism, an aggressive form of secularism that is still present in the country today. Basically, if Ferry's government conquered Madagascar, then there was no way that the London missionaries would retain their important role in society. So when Raini Lairifuni came to the LMS looking for help in preventing French conquest, they eagerly obliged. Despite Madagascar as a whole suffering through a currency crisis, the LMS was not short on currency at all, as they had an easy source of coinage provided through private donations to their organization. In order to secure funds for Malagasy weapons, the missionaries lent massive amounts of currency to the government at significantly below the market rate. Using this money, Raini Lairifuni sent agents to Tuamasina to procure as many foreign arms as possible. As tensions worsened, French ships began to blockade the port in an effort to stop the shipment of arms, forcing these government merchants to move their operation to Morandofa, hoping to find arms there. Meanwhile, the Fanampuana levies of Madagascar were remobilized to man the reactivated arms factory. The Merina war machine was churning once again. But while war was seeming increasingly inevitable with every passing month, Raini Lairifuni still sought to do everything he could to try and prevent a potentially expensive and destructive conflict with France. In a final desperate bid to avoid war, the Prime Minister recruited a group of seven men for an expedition abroad. The expedition consisted of four Hufa members, including two state bureaucrats, an academic in the form of the headmaster of the Royal Palace Academy, and a Malgasi Creole missionary scholar, who acted as a translator fluent in English, French, and Malgasi. Additionally, there were four non hufa in the form of the consul to the USA, two members of the London Missionary Society, and, perhaps the strangest of them all, a man named A. Tachi, the editor of Madagascar's English-language newspaper, the Malgasi Times. Yes, that's right, there was an English-language newspaper printed in Raini Lairifuni's Madagascar. No joke. If you want to learn more about Madagascar's first newspaper, as well as one of the oldest examples of print journalism in all of Africa, then check out our premium episode on the topic at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. Oh, that reminds me. With our current season reaching its final chapters, there's a new poll up on Patreon where members can vote on the topic of our next season. The next season will focus on uh, somewhere in North Africa, whether that be the medieval kingdoms of Morocco, empires that span through the sands of the Sahara, one of the many ancient societies that rose in the land of Nubia, or perhaps something else entirely. So if you want to gain a voice and say that you help decide the topic of next season, then you should go cast your vote at patreon.com slash historyofafrica. Now, this cobbled together envoy arrived at Tuamasina on August 1st but found that Baudé tried his best to delay their departure. However, after a few days of trying to keep them docked at Tuamasina, Baudé received orders that he was not to interfere with the diplomatic mission for the obvious international blemish that it would create. The group finally arranged a trip on a mail steamer called the Touareg, and sailed north to their first destination, France. Upon arriving in the first destination of their goodwill tour, 
the group found their negotiations in France to be expectedly fruitless. The Malagasy government had not expected much out of these direct negotiations with the French, but opted to include the trip to Paris anyways as a show of good faith. After a little more than two months of fruitlessly begging French bureaucrats to recognize the stipulations of the treaty their country had signed with Madagascar not too long ago, and those bureaucrats steadfastly refusing, the delegation moved on to their next destination. While they obviously couldn't convince the French not to invade, perhaps they could convince friendlier countries to support Madagascar and pressure France away from invading. The first and most obvious candidate was right across the channel in Britain. In November of 1882, the diplomatic party arrived in London. There they met with the Foreign Secretary of Britain. Now, compared to the cold reception they received in France, the British reception seemed more promising. Sort of. From the beginning, it became clear that Britain sympathized with Madagascar's plight against French aggression, but that they did not sympathize enough to act. When it came to the British public, they were living in an unprecedented era of global news, in which stories of intrigue and injustice around all parts of the world inundated their papers. For example, Madagascar had received 12 mentions in Britain's top newspaper, The Times, that year. While this might seem like a sizable number, though, remember that The Times printed hundreds of stories each week. Typically, British readers learning about the ongoing dispute between France and Madagascar would simply shrug and say, that's unfortunate before continuing to read about another story in some other unfortunate foreign country that provoked a similar reaction. Among the foreign office, the Malagasy envoys found a similar apathetic sympathy. The foreign secretary stated that he sympathized with the Malagasy, but would not be willing to take any moves that would potentially worsen Britain's relationship with France. This response from the British stung. At least with the French, the cold response had been expected. But the envoys had genuinely hoped that the London visit could result in some kind of diplomatic commitment from Britain. Embittered by their failure to secure anything of note in either of their journeys, the group then embarked to their final destination in February of 1883, across the Atlantic to New York City. Now, while there was certainly an aura of negativity following the failure to secure British support, the American visit still had some potential for benefits. For starters, unlike Britain and France, the United States didn't have a colonial policy in Africa. In fact, well, they didn't really have much of any kind of policy. The U.S. only possessed a few official diplomatic relations with a handful of African countries. By 1883, the U.S. had only a few scattered consuls across various kingdoms on the continent, in the modern regions of Gambia, Mozambique, Angola, Morocco, and of course, Zanzibar and Madagascar. For the most part, these consuls only really cared about protecting the interests of American merchants in the countries they operated in. Well, with one big exception that you probably thought I forgot to mention, which is Liberia. Yeah, Liberia is a very big exception to this rule and would end up playing a major part in convincing the Malagasy of the potential benefits of this American visit. Without going too far down the rabbit hole, the independent country of Liberia was the closest thing to resemble an American colony in Africa. In fact, for a while, it had been an American colony. Interestingly enough, Liberia was created to act as a colony for African Americans who had been freed from slavery. The colony was supported by both radical abolitionists, who wanted to give black Americans a place where they could live and thrive away from discrimination, as well as major slave owners, who believed that a large free black population was a ticking time bomb who could inspire uprising among their enslaved workers, and therefore wanted them gone. The colony eventually gained independence in the form of an amicable breakup in 1847, under the minority rule of an Americo-Liberian elite. Now, what mattered to our Malagasy envoys was that, while America had neglected most of the continent, the country had fiercely guarded Liberia from foreign incursion in the recent past. In just 1882, border disputes between Britain and Liberia led the countries to the brink of war only for American diplomatic intervention to ward off the British. It was this intervention in 1882 which encouraged the Malagasy to press forward. Perhaps they could provoke a similar response from the United States to the French threats against their own sovereignty. And of all the receptions that the envoy had received, the American ones seemed the most promising. As they sailed in on a steamer, flying the flag of Imerina proudly, 
the Americans gave a 14-gun salute, and the ambassadors received a proper diplomatic welcome. After a short ceremony and parade in New York, the envoy was hastily sent to Washington, D.C., where they met with American President Chester Arthur. The leader of the expedition, one of the Hofa bureaucrats, addressed the American president. The group presented him with a color book, or a diplomatic essay expounding on a country's diplomatic position, authored by the LMS missionary on the trip, which included a series of passages denouncing French aggression against Madagascar, and several quotations from Baudet confirming this aggression, including the harassment of the diplomatic mission against his superior's orders. With the book delivered, the Malagasy conference with the American government continued over the next few weeks before eventually coming to a close. The envoy then proceeded to tour across America, drumming up support from the American public for diplomatic intervention against France. And it was in America where they seemed to have the most success. The diplomats primarily focused on the two things that were the most precious to the American public, that is, money and Christianity. They pointed out in rallies that the French were threatening American commerce in Madagascar, that once France had their way and colonized the island, that they would surely seek to monopolize trade with their new colony. If Americans wanted to preserve trade in Madagascar, they had to act now to prevent the French invasion. But perhaps even more effective were their appeals to religion. During one particularly popular rally in Boston, Massachusetts, the Malagasy envoy played to the religious sympathies of the crowd by claiming that the French colonialism was an attack on Protestant Christianity itself. The leader of the expedition held a Bible aloft in his hand and declared, More important than commerce is the gospel which your fathers bore to us through storm and exile. Should France push aside the benefits of Christianity of civilization, it would be strange if there were no moral force at hand to resist this outrage. Speeches like that in Boston drew hearty support from the assembled crowds, but on the other hand, they did spark some unexpected backlash from the city's sizable Catholic minority. While American culture at the time generally favored isolation and foreign policy, it seemed like the Malagasy plea for help was reaching somebody at least. But while the public outcry against French aggression was considerable, and many Americans were willing to denounce France's actions, again, kind words were all that Madagascar received. The American press was generally sympathetic to the Malagasy cause, but reflected the isolationist culture that dominated America at the time, claiming that while France was in the wrong, that America did not have the right or even the capability to successfully intervene. One Washington Post article ridiculed those supporting intervention by sarcastically remarking that America, with its nine whole navy yards, would surely make a naval power like France tremble. In a bizarre twist, too, at least one American who had formerly lived on Madagascar was eager to point out the Medina hypocrisy on the matter. In a 16-page pamphlet in the local newspaper, he pointed out that the same Malagasy government which cried for freedom and self-determination for its own government had been forcefully trying to end the independence and self-determination of numerous other people across Madagascar, which, yeah, is kind of fair. While the American mission did manage to stir up a short-lived interest in Malagasy affairs, it too ultimately resulted in nothing. The American government similarly favored isolation, and refused to provide assistance to the Malagasy beyond allowing the continuation of already ongoing arms sales. Finally, with all their efforts exhausted, the Malagasy envoy returned home to Tuamasina with nothing to show for their efforts. Nobody was coming to rescue Madagascar from French incursion, if Malagasy independence was to survive the coming war, it was now up to Raini Lairifuni and the army. Join us in our next episode, as the French cannons bombard the ports, and the Malagasy army mobilizes to fight off the invaders. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, B.B. Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebelavie, Evan Edwards, Pascal Makocha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwadike, 
Shayun Oloronti Main, Quachua Manqua, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Rassan Firgiani, Niti, Kitty, and Tariq Beetleman, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.